Is this on? Hello. OK, everyone, I think we're about to get started with the next session here in just a couple minutes. So if everybody could please come back in and find your seats. Jen will uh, chime her chimes. All right, we're gonna get started our next session. And um, our first speaker is Dr. Lane Rodden, who is one of the newest members to the FARA team. Uh, Lane joined FARA July 1st. Yay. We stole her from Dr. Lynch. Um, <laughs> Um, but Lane uh, is our Director of Patient Engagement, and so I am, um, it's been really exciting to have Lane on our team. She um, is really gifted at trying to help um, us build our repertoire of educational materials, and so she helped with the packet of materials you received about clinical trial participation today. She also animates all the minutes of science videos that we put out. Yeah, yep. And um, so Lane's um, going to help us review some of the basics of gene therapy uh, development today. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Lane. Okay, thank you, Jen. So I think they're getting the slides up. Let me just, oh, here we are. Okay, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here today um, in this new role as Director of Patient Engagement. It's been amazing to see some familiar faces and to meet a lot of new faces. And for this session, we wanted to talk a little bit more about gene replacement and gene editing. You all heard a little bit about some programs that are going on um, with this type of therapy. And so uh, we wanted to spend a little bit of time updating you on all the progress that's been made and talk about what the future holds for gene therapies for FA. So I want to start with an image of a scientific paper that was published by Dr. Puccio, which is one of our FA scientists, and her lab almost eight years ago. And this was the first paper that showed that a gene therapy can treat and prevent heart disease in a mouse model of Friedrich's ataxia. So you can imagine, um, everybody was very excited about this. The community was excited, companies were excited, other academic groups were very excited about this. And now, eight years later, we have phase one clinical trials to test a gene therapy in people with FA and many, many other gene therapy programs in the discovery and preclinical development phases. So there's a lot of promise in gene therapies for FA, but with that promise comes specific challenges that are a little bit different than the challenges associated with, with other types of therapies. So let's talk about the wealth of information that we've learned, the challenges that we've overcome in the eight years since that first paper was published, and let's see what new challenges we're working on together. So we'll just start with some basics. We've heard a lot of terms today, um, DNA, genes, RNA, proteins, um, all of this type of biology 101. So I just have a, a brief section to kind of get everybody on the same page as far as terminology. Then we'll, then we'll talk about what is a gene therapy. Is this one type of therapy? Are there many gene therapies? What do we mean by gene therapy? And then we will get into some of the lessons that we've learned, the opportunities and the challenges for this type of therapy for FA. And then Jen Farmer will come up at the end to summarize how FARA and the community, all of you guys, are working together to accelerate this type of therapy for FA. Okay, so here's our biology 101. So all of our organs are made up of many cells, which you can see is the little circle with all of those things inside. And our cells are like tiny factories. They contain proteins and they contain mitochondria, other machinery and components that help the cell function properly. And if you see the inner circle, uh, there's a red arrow pointing to it that says DNA. That 
um, compartment within the cell is called the nucleus. And this is the compartment that houses all of our DNA. So this is the genetic blueprint that makes us who we are, essentially. Um, so DNA is categorized into units called genes. And a gene is a set of instructions that the cell uses to make a particular protein. So if all of the DNA, if you think about this like a cookbook, a gene is like a single recipe, for example. So the cell uses that gene as instructions to eventually make a protein. And there's an intermediate step in there, um, an, a different type of molecule called RNA. This is another type of genetic material, is an intermediate pro product uh, that's used to make the final protein. And we know in FA, there's a change in a particular gene called frataxin. That's another word that we've been hearing over and over. So frataxin is the name of a particular gene that's important to all of us in this room. So we know there's a change in the frataxin gene, this GAA repeat expansion that messes up this process and results in cells that are not making enough frataxin. So imagine if we could deliver a healthy copy of the frataxin gene without this GAA repeat expansion to the cell. Would the cell be able to use it to make a healthy amount of protein? So this is gene therapy at a basic level. And gene therapies really fall into two main categories. So on the left, uh, this first type we'll talk about is called in vivo, and I've just put the terms because they might come up, but what this really means is inside of the body. So for this type of gene therapy, the healthy copy of the gene, might be a little small on the screen, but it's still in that Amazon delivery truck, is delivered directly into the body. And this is usually administered into the bloodstream or uh, even directly into an organ. And if you look on the right side, this second type is called ex vivo, and this means outside of the body. So for this type of gene therapy, cells are removed from the body, then a healthy copy of the gene is delivered to the cell in a lab-type setting, and then the cells with a healthy copy of the gene are delivered back into the person. We're also going to talk about a similar concept called gene editing. And gene editing uses a pair of molecular scissors, so to speak, um, called CRISPR, that can actually cut out and remove parts of genes. So imagine like for the GA repeat expansion in the frataxin gene, for example. And just like healthy copies of genes can be delivered to cells, the gene editing scissors or the CRISPR components can also be delivered in this in vivo or ex vivo type of setting. Okay, so we've been using this picture of an Amazon truck to represent the delivery vehicle for the healthy gene or for the molecular scissors, but what actually are we talking about here? What, what is the actual delivery vehicle? So for many gene therapies, uh, we use viruses to deliver healthy copies of genes. And a specific type of virus called AAV, adeno-associated virus, is commonly used as a delivery vehicle for gene therapies. AAVs come in many different flavors, as you can see here in the picture. And this is an important point. Not all of these types of AAVs are able to make deliveries to all types of tissues. So you can see some AAVs can deliver genes to the liver. Some are better at delivering genes to muscle or heart or brain or the eye, for example. So we have lots of different um, flavors here. And we also talked about another a type of AAV earlier that uh, is being developed as a therapy for a gene therapy for FA. Okay, now that we've covered some of the basics, let's talk about the lessons that we've learned and the opportunities and challenges that have come up over this past almost decade um, since the gene therapy, uh, that first gene therapy paper was, was published. So again, we know gene therapies for FA hold great promise for possibly treating FA, and we've learned many lessons since that first paper was published, but we've also come across some challenges, and we have challenges that are general challenges for the entire field of gene therapy that also apply to FA, and then we have FA-specific challenges um, for development of gene therapies. For the general challenges, one of them that we'll talk about is that people can have an immune reaction to the virus 
delivery vehicle that's delivering the healthy copy of the gene. And sometimes we'll need to take medicine to help suppress the immune system um, while a gene therapy is being administered. This is also the reason that gene therapies can only be given to a person one time. So the body recognizes this virus, this delivery vehicle, as foreign and creates a memory of this. So if it's reintroduced to the person, the virus could get destroyed and the healthy gene would not be delivered. This may not be the case forever, though. If viruses can, for example, be successfully engineered to evade the immune response, or if other non-viral type of delivery vehicles can be developed, this challenge could be solved. And importantly, these are all active areas of research that FARA is funding with our academic and um, company partners. The second challenge is we also, we know that FA affects multiple organ systems, the, the main two being the nervous system and the heart. There are, there are also others that we've heard about today. And it's not easy to develop one gene therapy that can target both of these at the same time. So remember from the previous slide, different types of viruses have preferences for different types of cells. And there's not always a great one that can deliver genes to both nerve cells and heart cells, for example. So next, I just want to spend a few moments talking about some of the FA-specific challenges that we have for developing gene therapies. So we know that for taxin deficiency causes FA. It's responsible for the symptoms that people with FA experience. But we also now know that too much for taxin can also be harmful or toxic. And we know this because we have been studying this mechanism. Farah has been funding researchers that have been learning more about this. So we need to replenish the deficiency, but we also cannot overdo it. And then a second FA-specific challenge is that FA affects the nervous system, we know this, and we don't have an easy window to just take a little peek inside of somebody's brain or spinal cord. And so it can be hard to, to determine if we hit our target with this type of gene therapy. So we need better biomarkers for this. And Farah has been funding different research groups that are identifying and solving these problems as well. Okay. So here's a snapshot of, there are at least 20 logos on here, of all of the academic and pharmaceutical groups that are currently working on some aspect of gene therapies for FA, um, whether that be the studying the immune response to developing novel virus delivery vehicles or developing non-viral ve delivery vehicles, all the way to conducting phase one trials that you heard about earlier today. All of these groups are studying some component of gene therapies for FA. <laughs> it's, it's exciting. And then Jen and I are going to switch now, and uh, because we have an actively enrolling trial for gene therapies for FA, Jen's going to walk us through how trials for gene therapies are a little bit different than trials for other therapies. Thank you, Lane. So you, you saw um, a few things, I think, in Dr. Barth's presentation about the Lexio program. And one thing I want to point out um, that he mentioned that's part of the protocol is the cardiac biopsy. And it, it's important to mention, because Lane had just talked about how for some of the gene therapy development, like that we don't have a biomarker to know whether or not we're getting enough for taxin delivered to the brain or the spinal cord. And in the case of a cardiac gene therapy, you know, one of the reasons why this is a, a place for us to start with gene therapies is because we can measure for taxin if we do a cardiac biopsy. And so it's an important part of the, the clinical trial to help us know um, how effective the therapy is in a short period of time, because you all know the, the cardiac aspects of the disease can take a long time to manifest themselves. And we don't want to do a 20-year clinical trial to know if the gene therapy is effective or not. Um, and so as much as we can identify biomarkers that can inform us about the effectiveness and the safety 
of therapeutic interventions, that can help us reduce the time of some of these clinical trials. The other things that you probably noticed about the trial is that it's a relatively small number of people, right? Five people per cohort. Some of the other trials we were talking about might have more like 20 people per cohort or even you know, over 100 individuals enrolled. Gene therapy studies especially are gonna start pretty small with only a few people per cohort and they will also not have as many dose groups. You know, with a small molecule, I think when we started the Riata study, um, we started that we thought maybe we'd need four dose cohorts. We ended up going to seven. Um, you can do that with a small molecule. You can start really, really low and slowly titrate your, your way up. But in a gene therapy, we want the first dose to have some potential for efficacy. And so you begin a gene therapy trial um, having a better understanding of your potential therapeutic window, and so you really are only looking at, you know, typically two, sometimes maybe three different doses. So these are smaller studies in general. Um, we also, you know, will see likely in later stage trials that they will be placebo controlled, even if the placebo doesn't get like a, an intervention, um, but there will be a matched group of people that get followed alongside those who get the gene therapy so that there's a comparator group. Um, but again, they're likely to be much smaller. There might not be studies that enroll 100 or 150 individuals into an efficacy study. And in gene therapy, we also try and translate the information from those early studies into the later ones, again, to reduce the size and, and try and expedite this, this drug development process. The other important thing to note right now, because of this immune response with the gene therapies that we're able to develop using these vir the AAV viruses, is that for right now, um, people are only able to be in one gene therapy study. We are hopeful that that's something that can be changed by the you know, discovery of new viruses or non-viral vectors. Um, but this is an important thing to talk to study investigators about when you're considering participation in a clinical trial and just understanding um, you know, what the terms of the participation are. They're also gonna require you to be enrolled for a longer period of time. Um, and this is, you know, FDA wants people to be followed for at least five years when they're in a gene therapy trial. And so you can expect that this is a longer term commitment. And that is, you know, both for your safety um, as well as for us to really understand what happens in the short and the long term. So just a few other things that um, Lane touched on briefly that I wanted to expand upon. Um, so what are we trying to do? You know, we've got all these people working in the field. We know that there are, there are some challenges. Um, how, how do we try and overcome those and continue to advance these exciting therapies? So as we mentioned, there's a lot of work going on in the FA community as well as outside the community to continue to develop new viral vectors and non-viral vectors. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on now with um, like lipid nanoparticle type molecules or what they call exosomes. Um, so I would expect that you know, a few years from now, we're gonna have more tools in the toolbox for delivery of different types of gene therapies. The other aspect, like I said, is this immune response. And there are strategies being developed um, to kind of pre-treat people before gene therapy so that they don't develop as robust immune response so that they might be able to get another gene therapy down the road. Um, as well as even some of the viral vectors themselves are now being designed or decorated in a way so that they evade the immune response. Um, so there's really clever technology being developed to try and solve this issue because it's, it's not just an FA issue. And there are many inherited conditions that are, you know, we need gene therapies for that affect multiple organ systems. And you want to be able to treat the heart and the brain and the eye and the skeletal muscle. 
And right now with, you know, a single viral vector, we, we just can't do that. Um, and so these, these are problems that I believe will be solved, but, you know, I don't think, I think what I've heard from the FA community is we don't want to wait for that. You know, we don't want to wait. And we need to continue to be a part of evolving this therapeutic landscape and, and bringing these therapies forward. And so we're doing this in a stepwise way. And that, again, comes back to why we need a diverse approach to treatments. We're not gonna have just one and be done. Um, we're gonna need to combine gene therapies with other types of therapies. The other things that we're doing um, are, you know, more broadly in the community, outside the lab. We are working with our clinicians in the clinical research network to um, develop gene therapy readiness at the centers. Um, their IRBs need to be ready to review a gene therapy protocol. Their pharmacies need to be able to deal with gene therapy products. Um, and these are different kinds of products than what they're used to. Um, and then, you know, there's clinician and researcher training to be able to, to conduct these trials. There's also um, education for, for our community about what gene therapies are and helping you through the decision-making informed consent process. And last year, we developed a series of materials and webinars. They're on the website. Um, these will be continuing education that we're going to continue to develop. We also will, you know, continue to ask um, our gene therapy community to come and provide more detailed education on their programs. And Lexio did this for us earlier this year with a webinar. And we're going to be doing more surveys. And I know we send you a lot of surveys. Bridget looked at me like, oh, not another survey. I saw that. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we do. We survey you a lot. But um, you know, it's really important for us to learn as this new kind of therapy gets developed how people weigh risks and benefits and what kinds of um, information you need to make decisions about these trials, and also with certain types of information, how do you weigh risk and benefit, and so that we can design trials better with, with your input. And so you will see um, some gene therapy study surveys coming from us. And then finally, I wanted to end um, with activities that we're doing with the regulatory agencies, and also with bringing together um, our industry sponsors and our academic community, you know, not only do we bring folks together for scientific conferences and exchange of information um, like we do today with the community, um, but we also um, reached out to FDA at the beginning of this year. And I should say Ron reached out to FDA at the beginning of this year. He um, wrote to the division director for cell and gene therapies and said, you know, we're hearing from a lot of our industry sponsors that they have questions about developing gene therapies for FA that they need answers to earlier in their drug development process, partially because of the challenges we just talked about. And right now, the FDA you know, is spread really thin. There are lots of gene therapy programs coming in in front of this division, and they're, they're not having as many in-person meetings, and they're responding to company requests for meetings with just some written responses. And so there's no dialogue that occurs with a written response. And Ron asked if we could have um, a meeting with their division to talk about some of the challenges in a pre-competitive way, where Farah would solicit questions and information from the industry community and expert advice from some of our academic and scientific advisors, put that all together and kind of conduct what would be a pre-IND meeting, but in a non-competitive way. And the division director responded positively and gave us a meeting, which we were really excited about. And then we realized all this work we were going to have to do <laughs> uh, because he gave us um, a very, he gave us some very specific mandates. He said, you know, it has to be pre-competitive. 
You have to include everybody in the community, you know, get their input. Um, we need a full briefing document from you ahead of time. Um, you have to conduct the meeting and everybody needs to be able to like listen in and have access to it. So needs to be an open forum. You need to conduct the whole thing. Um, and so our meeting is gonna be October 14th. Um, we have assembled the briefing document. It's right here. Um, Barbara Tate, um, who's not here with us today, um, she's our chief scientific officer. Um, she is taking a much needed break right before this meeting because she finished this document. Um, she's, she's running a marathon in Berlin. Um, so she's, it's not a real break really. Um, but Barbara worked with several regulatory advisors and reached out to all of our industry sponsors, got their input, met with Dr. Lynch, Dr. Pandolfo, Dr. Puccio, um, other, other folks in our scientific advisory board, and kind of assembled, this document contains everything we know about developing gene therapy for FA, and the questions, and it also proposes solutions, so that the FDA can respond to the solutions that we propose and kind of give us insights for things where, yes, we agree that is a good approach for that problem, or no, maybe you should think about this, or maybe you should think about that. And that will help everybody kind of understand how to deal with some of the challenges that we have in front of us. And so um, we, you know, I thought it was important to mention this because this is kind of one of those behind the scenes things that happens, um, but, it's, um, I, we are hopeful that this will be a really informative meeting for our entire community um, and helps us move forward these types of therapies more, more quickly and, and in a more informed way. So um, I think with that, we are done with um, our prepared remarks. I can open it up for a few questions. I think I have three minutes. Norm's got a question, all right. Oh, so that, okay, I remember the question. Um, so, so if Donovan was in a gene therapy, and we're saying it's gonna be five years, then he would be excluded from any of the other uh, protocols coming down the pike, right? Because there's no combinations yet, or are we thinking on a way that that's gonna be included? So right now, when you're enrolled in any interventional study, you're usually excluded from other interventional studies because you want to study the intervention. <laughs> so right now, gene therapy studies are typically five years. And so, yes, for those five years, you would be excluded from other, other interventional studies. Um, Jay's still here, but I believe on the webinar, the question came up, well, what about if a drug gets approved? And um, in response to that question, Jay had informed us that if there's an approved therapy, they will likely consider letting people take the approved therapy after one year. So after they've had a full year to look at the safety um, of their, their therapy, they could then let people go on to new medicines that are approved on top of the, the experimental. Is that right, Jay? All right, thanks. <laughs> Go ahead, Andy. But if, assuming you have a control group, is the placebo, does it contain the virus vector, an empty one, or not? Oh, great question. Um, in gene therapy studies, the placebo does not contain the virus. It is true. If it's getting injected into the bloodstream, it's just like saline. Um, no, because then that would disqualify you exactly. from future yeah. studies. Um, but one of the things we are talking to the FDA about in this upcoming meeting is for some of the gene therapies that target the brain, it's an invasive procedure um, to be able to get the virus where we need it to go. And so we're talking to them about whether or not um, sham procedures would need be required, or could you randomize people to intervention 
no intervention. The people who are in the intervention arm have the procedure, get the treatment, and the other people are, are followed alongside um, with the argument that the intervention itself really shouldn't have any impact on the outcome of the therapy or the safety. Yes. Joan. I think it's important to note that Tiffany um, went to Wheel Cornell for the gene therapy and that the reason she was particularly interested was because there is no placebo that all 12 patients that get it will all get the therapy. The first six will get the smaller dose and then the sec next six will get the higher dose. And I thought that was a big plus for doing that particular trial. Thanks, Joan. Yeah, and I think um, Dr. Barth mentioned this as well. In, in their phase one study, everybody um, gets the active agent. There is no placebo. And that's um, also pretty common. I'm glad you brought that up. That is pretty common in gene therapy phase one studies is that um, they try and minimize placebo. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to um, make sure we have time for our next session. The next session up is clinical trial participation, and so I would like to invite up to the stage our, our speakers and our panelists. So while our panelists are getting seated, I will give you a very brief overview on our panel today, what we have, why we're having it, and what is that guide for participants. Yeah, you have seen the big poster at the entrance uh, in the hall outside. So as you have heard um, at many instances this morning, the research pipeline has grown to more than of 12 unique treatment approaches and to expand equitable access to clinical trials to the worldwide FA community, education is essential, and this fits perfectly in FERA's mission. We need, uh, we need education, actually, to explain all the research that support treatment approaches, to design clinical trials that are more and more patient-centric, and to explain the regulatory process that would lead to approval. So in our panel outline, I will give you a brief overview of the material, then we will introduce our panelists, and we will have a, a small game, panels trivia, and we will end up with some Q&A to our panelists, and we have, if we have more time, maybe to some of you also. So in, in line with what I have presented before, last year, the Pfizer Foundation has launched a request for proposal titled Equity and Access to Rare Disease Clinical Trials. And if you remember all the words I've said before, we, we sort of applying because that was a great opportunity of us and we were successful. And we have a current grant entitled Expanding Worldwide Access to Clinical Trials for FA Through Education for the Patient Community and Industry Partners. So our goals are two mainly. The first one is to facilitate informed understanding of clinical trial process to the FA community worldwide, but also to facilitate understanding of your preference and your needs to our industry partners present here today. So they create more clinical trials that are patient-centric and they 
our, our hope is they will have streamlined um, operations that will reduce the burden and the barriers to enrollment to participation to clinical trials. And for the community, we had created this. You will find it in your folders. Have a look, read it, raise questions. You can sc scan the QR code that is outside on the poster, but also on the paper material. It's a 12 pages. And why, well, what you will find inside, basically, contains a description of the safeguards and responsibilities that are undertaken by, by all the stakeholders of clinical trials process. So you'll better understand how your safety is, your, uh, is controlled, what's the risk benefit. We have um, developed picture guides and terminology graphics that will help you to understand the regulatory process that will lead hopefully to approval. And then we developed and implemented resources to raise awareness of academic research, but also clinical trials that are happening. And we wanted actually to facilitate access through an informed understanding of the trials. So on the first page, you will have a nice clinical trials introduction, resuming the outline of the other pages, followed by a description of the process for the drug to be approved. Why does it take so long, actually? And what are the steps that every stakeholder needs to respect and pass it to get to the second one? What is the difference between clinical trial and clinical study? Probably many of you have participated or considering participating to one of these two categories. And we have a mini dictionary for the terms you would like to know while hearing about clinical trials or participating to clinical trials. Sometimes the jargon is not easy. We have clinicians, clinical coordinators who will tell you many words, so don't hesitate to go through the list to better understand what do they mean. We try to summarize what are the phases of clinical trials, what is checked at each phase. And importantly, we, we wanted to try actually to design or detail the roles and responsibilities undertaken by each stakeholder within a clinical trial, before enrollment, during the study, and hopefully after. And it's very important actually to highlight that your participation is important, like you have a role, you are empowered in a clinical trial also, and you are also responsible. So it's very good to understand the process. And there is also clinical trial etiquette. What can we do, say, show on media, what we cannot do? And we, we try to, to put it in this part. And last but not least, the informed consent for clinical trials. Usually it's a huge packet of papers parents or participants will read during the first visit or before getting to a trial. It is very important to understand what is it about and to raise questions and to be ready for, to, to approach actually this informed consent. We meant to have a blank place at the bottom of each part of these. There are suggest suggestions of questions, but please feel free to use this material to add any questions, to take notes during your meetings. So we really hope that you will get at the end to an effective decision, decision making for any enrollment. And with this, I would like to introduce the panelists. Each one will introduce very briefly um, himself before we go to the GV animated by Maureen. So next to Maureen, we have Emily Young, and then we have Jake Yaip, Claire Yaip, and Noah Griffith at the end. Emily, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? <laughs> I'm from Central Illinois. I went to school there. I got my bachelor's and master's, and um, now I work full-time as an inpatient social worker at a hospital nearby. Um, this is my first Ferris symposium, but my first Ferris memory was 
In 2008, shortly after I was diagnosed, my family and I went on a river rafting trip down the Colorado River. And when we were there, we met Ron Bartek and his amazing family. And that's how my sister, Jamie, actually started working at Vera then. And since then, I have been in two clinical trials, Actimmune with Horizon and OMAV with Riata. Thank you, Emily. Hi, my name is Jake. I'm 16 years old and I'm a junior at University of Liggett High School in Detroit, Michigan. I'm really proud that I'm the vice president of my junior class. And also, I'm the state record holder for the 100 meter and 200 meter wheelchair ab adaptive track races. <laughs> Uh, in my free time, I have completed a slew of clinical trials, including, but not limited to, the Epicatechin uh, trial at Mayo, PTC743 at CHOP, um, and methylprednisolone at CHOP. Um, and the reason I participate in these clinical trials, well, I have a lot of reasons but um, mostly it's to help everybody out. The days there are really long and really hard and we have to do like really tough tasks like saying Pataka over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're really difficult tasks and sometimes it makes me wanna uh, like do anti-disestablishment <laughs> arianism. Sorry, I had to win a bet. <laughs> um, and just leave the trial. But then I remember every year how I come here and I see all the smiling faces of my friends and family and I see tons of companies up on these floors ready to devote their blood, sweat, and tears to making my life a little better. And it gives me the hope and the encouragement that I need to go through the tough things and the hard days and the long days to help everybody else. And in that, it will help me as well. So thank you, guys. OK, so hi, everyone. I'm Claire. I'm 15, and I'm also going to University League at school, but I'm a sophomore. So I was diagnosed when I was nine. And it was only after that Jake was diagnosed that I um, got a genetic diagnosis. So a few things about me are I'm the volleyball team manager for my school. I'm the director of business operations, which is such a fancy title <laughs> for, um, for my school's uh, musical. And I'm also really into science, and I want to be a doctor someday. No, Dr. Lynch, not a neurologist. <laughs> so over this summer, I spent two weeks at Ann Arbor doing a anatomy and physiology camp. So participating in research is really important to me because it's one of the best and one of the only things that I can do as a patient right now. So I have been in all the clinical trials that Jake listed, and also the NAD plus exercise study at CHOP, which Dr. McCormick talked about. You should totally enroll, you get a free trial, which is <laughs> awesome. So both Jake and I have done a bunch of uh, clinical studies, including the natural history study, the IDEA study at the University of Chicago, the Meisner corpuscle study at the University of Rochester in New York, and at CHOP, we've done 
the FDA biomarkers in children, the one where we wore a glucose monitor for a bit, the one with the MEP, um, an OCT and vision one, and Jake did one with the cardiac MRI. And we've also done some telephone research studies um, at University of Rochester. And we have always allowed for our blood to be used um, in other research. So there are countless other um, labs that our blood has been used in. So yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Noah Griffith. I'm 21 years old and a senior in journalism at Auburn University in Alabama. Um, I'm a sports journalist, so usually I'm on the opposite end of these things, like in your position, asking questions. So this is new to me, so bear with me. Um, but I'm honored to be up here. First off, I just want to give a short tribute to my dad, who passed away this summer unexpectedly. Um, he was a big, faithful supporter of Farah, and um, we went to the Energy Ball in 2019 in a van in Tampa, and he took me to several of my clinical trial visits at the University of Florida. He was my red taxi buddy, and um, we rode bike together. I have a trike that I was granted from a taxi and a athlete initiative in 2020, and um, he got a bike after that, and we started doing rides together. Um, in fact, he was planning on coming up to this ride with me that um, we participated in yesterday. So um, I know you'd be proud to see me speaking up here today, and um, I'm thankful to have my mom here with me. and. It's just it's wonderful to be here, so thank you. So a little bit about me. I'm from Salem, Alabama. And like I said, I'm a sports writer. I was diagnosed at age 16. I'm 21 now, after having onset of symptoms at age 14. Um, I loved playing sports before my diagnosis. I played baseball and basketball. Um, and really my way to stay involved in that after being diagnosed is, like I said, being a sports writer, um, I still get an inside look on things and I enjoy uh, making relationships with the players and coaches, you know, even though I can't be on the field. Um, so that, I've really found my passion doing that and also um, using my platform to advocate for those with disabilities and who can't be a voice for themselves. So this past spring, I wrote a column um, highlighting my experiences as, as a disabled person getting into basketball games at Auburn University, and it kind of took off and made a big impact. Um, so the university saw my article and made changes to the student, student section to where people with mobility issues can now reserve front row seats at the games. And um, I just love seeing how that's kind of made such a big impact and much bigger than I could have expected when writing it. I actually was nervous to publish it, and um, my dad and my mom read it, and uh, they were like, you definitely need to put that out. That's going to make a big impact on everyone and kind of give people an idea of what it's like, because um, not many people think about that kind of stuff, but yeah, it was great to see how it's benefited at all the disabled community at Auburn. Um, 
and I was hoping that I'd carry into other sports and not just basketball, but unfortunately at work on the story now, the football stadium at Auburn does not have spritz, um, rails on the stairs. So I'm trying to trying to m make a change there. Um, and if that's what, if riding on every sport is if that's what it takes to make Auburn more accessible, I'm willing to do that. Um, and lastly, I'm involved in the MOXIE study at the University of Florida as well as Tri Cafe, the COM study, natural history study, biomarkers, and I've also been in some um, studies over the phone at Rochester like them. And um, I'm hopeful for a treatment and a cure for FA, and I want to do whatever I can do to help achieve that. So thank you. All right, well, those are some big shoes to fill, so I will just do a very brief introduction of myself. Hi, everyone, I'm Maureen Yife. Um, in the FA world, I'm more commonly known as Jake and Claire's mom, <laughs> which is a title I wear with pride. Um, and so, uh, as you've heard, Jake and Claire have participated in a lot of clinical research over the years, and I have been with them at almost all of those studies. And so, um, as I was saying to one of the coordinators at CHOP, Kelly, we've had a lot of fun. I, I know it sounds a little strange, but we've had a lot of fun at some of the visits. We've made a lot of memories on the trips that we've taken. Um, but most importantly, we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. And so it's an honor for me to be able to share some of those lessons that we've learned uh, with the broader community. Um, and it kind of manifests itself in, in these materials that we've prepared. So um, if you remember, Jen promised you a lively panel discussion. Um, and so what will make things more lively than a quiz? <laughs> um, and our panelists have kindly agreed to play along. Uh, but what I didn't tell them is that I have given all of you the answer key. Um, so the answer to all of the quiz questions are in these pa uh, packets that are here with you. So if you want to take them out, you can feel free to play along at your own tables and see if you can beat them to the answers. Uh, Jamie has provided us with some awesome buttons that make very different noises. Um, so oh, Jake's, of course, testing his out. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> All right, so let's do a sample question just to see if we understand the format, panelists. All right, here we go. So what is Jen's favorite way to exercise? Emily? Running. Well, in fact, it is running. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> All right, ready to dive into some of the more serious materials? Here we go. What percentage of treatments that enter a clinical trial get approved? Fifteen percent. Oh, Jake was actually very close. He guessed fifteen percent. The actual answer is approximately ten to twenty percent of drugs that enter clinical trials eventually get approved. Uh, which means that it's a process that requires a lot of hope and optimism, but also a lot of patience. Um, and even those trials that don't ultimately go on to get approved teach us something, whether it's something about uh, the, the mechanism of disease or trial design, we learn from all of those. Uh, and so um, we, we can continue to stay optimistic and continue to work through our clinical trials. All right, on to the next question. How long does it take for a treatment to become available from an idea that's in the lab all the way through to the pharmacy? <laughs> Noah. We're gonna say about 10 years. Oh, that's optimistic actually. So the answer to this one can also be found on the drug approval uh, page. So a drug or treatment on average takes 12 to 15 years. Uh, so again, it's a process that has a lot of safeguards in place and requires a lot of patience, um, but it is one that uh, the FA community is uh, very, getting very familiar with. All right, if one country approves a treatment, is it automatically available worldwide? 
Noah again. I like it. Star student over here. Okay. No, no it's not. Correct. Uh, so each country has its own regulatory approval process. And so when a drug or treatment is approved in a country, it becomes available for the citizens of that country, but it does not mean that it's suddenly available globally. Nice work. Okay. If you are one of the awesome people participating in the Track FA, <laughs> are you in a trial or are you in a study? Jake. <laughs> I am in a study. <laughs> that is exactly right. Uh, Track FA is an observational study. So it's not testing um, an intervention. There are no drugs, no treatments, no devices. Um, it's looking at biomarkers. Uh, and so as you can see on, on your handout here, um, this kind of outlines the difference between a trial and a study uh, and what makes each um, Dif distinct and different from each other. Okay, if neither you nor the investigator know if you're taking a placebo or active drug, what kind of trial are you in? Claire. You're in a double blind study. That's exactly right. Okay, it's so that's exactly right. In a double blind study, no one, even the study sponsor, doesn't know which study arm the participants are in. None of them know uh, which treatment a participant is receiving. Um, so the thing I'd like to highlight about this is there are some really um, unusual terms that we use in clinical research, and sometimes it can sound like a foreign language. You hear that something is double blind, and you kind of scratch your head of like, what, what does that mean? So this page is intended to kind of demystify some of those common terms. Uh, and so you can read through it at your leisure, but that one's on double blind. Okay, true or false? Phase one trials test if a treatment works, if it's effective. I would say no, it tests safety. And Claire, you are right. That is correct. <laughs> so a phase one trial is looking at side effects. It's looking at how a body processes the drug. It's looking at dosing. So how much and how often should the treatment be taken? It is not testing how effective is the drug. Uh, and so there are nuances between the different phases of clinical trials. And we tried to uh, communicate those in a visually approachable way on this page. OK. Who monitors and reviews all the study data throughout a trial? Oh boy. Probably the study monitors. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so sort of. Um, <laughs> And there's an acronym, as you might expect, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, or DSMB. So Jake, yeah, I'd say we can give you sort of quasi-credit for that one, half Plus or minus. <laughs> so before the trial even starts enrolling, uh, DSMB is set up by a study sponsor, and it includes clinical experts in both Friedrich's ataxia and then also safety monitoring. Um, it can include members from the FA community. And then during the study, uh, the DSMB monitors and reviews all study data throughout the trial, and they can recommend action if they find a study risk. All right, true or false, it's okay to tell people you're participating in a trial. Noah. True. I hope it's true, because we had you guys introduce yourselves and say what trials you were all in. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a really unfortunate bait and switch. Yes, that's absolutely true. So this is a page that talks about some of the clinical trial etiquettes, do's and don'ts. Um, so talking about the trial, absolutely A-OK -okay to share with family and friends that you've enrolled in a clinical trial. Uh, what becomes uh, more of the don't side is if a trial is blinded, you shouldn't share how you think the drug or treatment is making you feel, even with the team that's at the, um, the site study team, because this can jeopardize the integrity of the research. I like the soundtrack. <laughs> okay, true or false, it's no big deal to quit a trial before it's over just because you don't think it's helping. Claire? False. 
Correct. Uh, that would be false. So in the, um, in the etiquette page on follow through, it's important to understand the number of visits and the tests that will be done and any other requirements that you'll be asked to uh, fulfill. Research in any study is voluntary, of course. Um, but understanding what the, what the study protocol is uh, and following through uh, is something that's important, again, to the integrity of the research for the entire FA community. All right, how do you know what questions to ask before enrolling in a clinical trial? <laughs> okay, so I have a whole list of questions. Okay, so, but if you're in the audience and you don't, they don't have your phone, how would they find, oh. <laughs> how would they know the questions? Okay. <laughs> well, I know that in my, all of my mom's hard work that she made a page, there's a few pages of questions to ask, so it'll probably be in your packet. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly right. You consult the packet. Um, so we've put together a list of um, it's four pages, like Claire said, it's long. It's, it looks like a lot of words and it can be overwhelming, but um, they range from uh, sort of like logistical questions like, are there costs that I will have to pay for, um, to more uh, uh, philosophical questions like, how will I feel if the overall study succeeds but the treatment was not successful for me? So these are things to think about as you go into an informed consent conversation um, at a research study site uh, so that it can be more of a dialogue and more of a back and forth with the coordinators and the site study team so that you can really have thought through uh, all the things that you would want to know before enrolling in the study. So there you go. Hopefully this will be a helpful resource for those of you that have been following along at home. It is posted on the FARA website uh, and you can follow the QR code or get there by navigating to curefa.org slash trial. Um, okay, and so with that, we'll turn it over to our panel. Actually, so Claire, we are going to start with you, and uh, I'm glad that you have the answer to this because the question I'm going to ask you is, what are the questions you asked or wish you had asked when you first participated in a clinical trial? Okay, so now I have my whole list. <laughs> so one of the best things to ask, well, everything is a great question, but one of the things I like to ask is, what are the endpoints and how do you measure them? Because that's really important in like collecting the data and it will help you know what you need to do to um, participate in the trial. And so another question that kind of tags along with that is what do you need to do to participate in the trial? whether it's taking pills or exercising or doing questionnaires at home, um, it's always a good idea to know what you're getting into. Um, so one of the other things is what are the risks? So we know that with all drugs, there will be probably a side effect to the drug. And you want to weigh the benefits and risks to see if it is actually a good idea for you to start participate in this study. And of course, if it's a study, that probably means that it is a good idea, <laughs> but it's still important to know the risks. So the last thing I want to say is there are no bad questions. Any question you ask is valuable and it's good for you to ask any question. So, yes, thank you for listening, and Mom and Miriam. Thank you, Claire. So my question to Jake, can you tell us about a time when it was difficult to follow a study protocol? 
And I know why I'm asking the question and not Omar. <laughs> <laughs> and then what have you learned about importance of a well-conducted study and a compliant budget? Thank you. Oh boy, is this a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am notoriously bad at taking my pills. So uh, there was one I was in a while back uh, where we took three sets of pills. And the first one and the last one were easy because those were at dinner and breakfast. So I would have them at the table and I would take them perfectly. But whenever we visited the site, I would always skate over um, the compliance line barely because of that midday pill. I would always forget it because I'd be on the go and there would be no water or no food or no pills and I couldn't take them. So it turns out, and get ready for a little bit of corporate advertising, <laughs> there's this app on my phone called the Remind that as its name suggests, reminds me when to take my pills. <laughs> and it's made me much more compliant and now I have learned that sometimes I need to use tools to get my compliance back on track. Thank you. All right, Noah, what advice would you give to new clinical trial or study participants? I think my biggest advice would be just to jump in at first. Um, when I was diagnosed at 16, I joined trial that summer. I was 17 at the time. Um, and I went into it really nervous and really unsure of myself. Um, really why I joined it, it wasn't me like making the decision. My mom really found out about it and asked me if I wanted to do it. And I was like, sure, why not, you know? Um, but as time has gone on, I've gotten a lot more comfortable and I've made a lot of great relationships with my study coordinators and neurologists, AUF and everything like that. They're all great. and. I would just say the people that run your study are on your side. They want to cure just like you do. Oh man, they're working for that. And the relationship between you and your study coordinators and it, that's just as important as the research that you're helping them do. Um, the relationship is really, really important. And if you're not they're making relationships and talking with the people that run your study. I would say you're not getting the most out of your study. Um, Cause like, like they've said, there are times, I'm gonna be honest, there are times when I'm taking this drug and I'm like, you know, I don't think this is helping me. Why am I doing this? But when I go back every six months, I'm reminded of why I'm doing this. Um, it's because of the relationship that I made. It's making a difference more in my life more than any drug could. Um, and so just as I look back on the years I was at my church, I wish I could have those first two years back too. I feel like I kind of wasted those first two years. So I would say first, join, you have to be ready when you join. Um, and two, they're on your side, jump into it head first, be involved, um, and trust them, because they're there for, to work for you. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Omar. Emily. You have told us you have participated in two trials. Can you tell us how you balance the hope and the excitement of participating in a clinical trial and possibly getting to receive a drug versus the reality that participating to a clinical trial is participating to a scientific experiment and you never know what eventually this outcome is? Are we <laughs> never stop doing the buzzer, that's great. So, I wrote my response out on the plane right here, and it's on my phone now, so bear with me. That is a good question. Jamie 
Jamie told me my question, and I was like, oh, that'll be so easy, so simple, right? Because you just do it, no matter what the consequences are. And I gave my first shot at answering this question to Miriam, Maureen, Jamie, and my other panelists. And I was doing it, and it was so hard to try to rein in everything that I was thinking and feeling about all of the trials because it's just a ton to think about. So I was at work, and I got back to my desk, and I sat there, and I started thinking about when I first joined the Axe-Immune trial. Uh, a couple of weeks before I started, you know, I was trying to learn how to do self-injections and, like, do the needle administration and everything like that. I was trying to learn how to put a freezer in my dorm to keep all that at like the pristine temperature. And that was challenging. Then I fast forward to a few weeks when I'm into it, when I'm tired and I'm, you know, taking an hour out of my day every other day to try to do this and I'm getting bruises from trying to inject myself and then you fast forward a few months into it when you're thinking oh I've gotten used to it this really isn't that bad maybe it's even helping me or one of my friends and then you're a lot of months into it and it's all going fine and everything is just normal now and you get the news that the trial is ending that it will not be continued and Pretty much any hope I had of it maybe helping me were dash. The word devastation does not even begin to cover what I felt. So I was at work when I was thinking about all this and I completely broke down because I realized that this question is the most unsimple and complex thing that you have to deal with at this point in my journey with the FA so far. To try to balance the hope that I feel for a drug versus the reality of it, you know, maybe being placebo, to be in a trial, to disrupt my life, my family, my friends, to use finances, my time, my energy, my emotions, and all for some medicine that might be a placebo. A few months after the Horizon study finished up, I started a new trial with Brianna Moxie, and I did a six-month double-blind uh, part in that. And even now, I'm just as hopeful as ever that this maybe could be it. Last week, I went to my supervisor at the end of a very long day at work and I just started breaking down. I was crying. The fatigue I felt was 
one of the the worst days I've ever felt fatigue. I'd been working full time for about a year and it was way too much for me. I am the last person on this earth that will ever admit that I cannot do something or that something is too much for me. But my body could not do this anymore. And I think the hardest part of that might be admitting it out loud. So I think to answer your guys' question, I am still trying to figure out how to balance, you know, the hope that I'm on a drug that might help us against the reality that I might be on placebo. I wake up every morning and I know that I definitely do not want to have to admit what I can and cannot do anymore. And when I take my meds or when I travel to the doctor, I do whatever I can. And I, I just do it because I know there will come a day where we don't have to ask if Maybe this will be the one helping us. We'll know that it's helping all of us. Thank you all for your inspiring answers. Please reach out to us if you have any questions on the material. And I would like to thank all the team who worked on the material internally at Fera, but also all the external comments we got from study coordinators, phys physicians, ambassadors. Thank you. Do we have time? Before we open for questions, is there one more thing I could add on to Emily's response? Do you mind? No, go for it. Your response was great, Emily, but there's a quote I wanted to share. Um, there's a quote I like from FA News blogger Kendall Harvey. I intend to hold on to the hope of a cure swooping in and saving me with a loose grip so that I don't start moving so that I don't stop moving forward while waiting for one. Um, that really resonates with me and living my life with FA, um, in spite of FA. So for example, I'm not gonna stop exercising, taking classes, applying for jobs, you know, all that kind of stuff because of FA, I intend to keep living my life as if a cure is not a thing. And if it does come, that's great. And I hope that does come, but I'm not gonna stop living while I wait for it. Um, I still have hope for a cure, but that is like a secondary thought to being successful without one. Thank you very much. Um, as our panel's coming down, one other thought. Um, so these materials are also going to be translated into multiple languages. So Miriam is our director of global relations. And a big part of this project also addressed a lot of the needs 
um, outside the U.S. with our global community and the education that they also need for clinical trials. And so we're excited that um, with Miriam's help, we're going to be able to have these materials um, for our whole global FA community. So, as many of you know, um, there are many people in the FA community who give so much of themselves to share their time, their expertise, fundraising outreach, mentorship. This is an incredible community. And I am honored to work alongside all of you every day. We have a few service recognitions before we break for lunch. We don't often take the time to do this, um, to recognize people in our community um, for the service that they provide. And um, I, I, I think that's something we need to do more of. Um, you know, to really celebrate ourselves and each other. And so the first award is one that um, we actually awarded at our June board meeting. And I wanted to share with you. It is the Ronald J. Bartek Acting Together, um, Acting Together Award. Several years ago, Farah established this award to recognize the above and beyond contributions of an individual to advancing FARA's mission in the spirit of our core values of collaboration. We established the Acting Together Award in Ron's name. And this year, we'd like to recognize the long-term and extraordinary contributions of Mary Caruso. I hope Mary's online. <laughs> Mary um, is one of Farah's founding board members and often speaks of our work today as standing on the shoulders of giants. And Mary is one of those giants. She set out to fund research when her kids were diagnosed before there was a Farah. And she funded Dr. Branya J. Keats's lab. And for those of you who don't know, Branya was searching, working really hard to find the FA gene. I have the best story of, shortly after I met Mary, I, I heard a story from her where she was describing how she was um, secretly crashing a mitochondrial research conference just so she could get more information about FA and mitochondria. And they were, giving away CoQ10 at a booth. And Mary just couldn't help herself. And she started like grabbing all the CoQ10 and putting it in her shirt. And, <laughs> and I love that story because if you know Mary, you know there is not a thing she wouldn't do for her children or for this community. Mary has been raising funds for research for 27 years. And she has held her annual event, an evening of peace, love, and acceptance last week. Mary also travels to other events and conferences to volunteer all the time. She is a founding director of FARA, and her perseverance and commitment to raising funds, being a, a patient voice for advocacy and to our industry partners has never wavered. We presented Mary, like I said, with this award at our board meeting back in June, but we really wanted to publicly recognize her here. And so please join us in congratulating Mary on receiving the Ronald J. Bartek Acting Together Award. So this next um, award recipient, I hope, is also um, joining us virtually. I actually was um, contacted by several of you in the community. I, I'm constantly reminded by many of you in the community about the service that this individual provides to all of us. We have the honor of presenting a special service award on behalf of the FA community. I think everyone in this room is familiar with the volunteer-led FA Parents Group, where parents come together 
via email to share questions, information, and provide support. This group was started by parents in 1997, and the lead moderator of the group is Paul Conance. I've heard from countless newly diagnosed parents about the hours spent on the phone with Paul as he answered questions and oriented people to this new FA landscape. To know Paul is to know his tireless commitment to the FA community. To know Paul is to sometimes good naturedly be prompted <laughs> by him to do better. <laughs> I might have been on the receiving end of that a few times. <laughs> to know Paul is to know his devotion to his daughter Brianna and all FAers. This 25 years of service award is presented to Paul Conans, also known as Uncle Paul, in recognition of his steadfast counsel and leadership in the FA Parents Group and the FA community. Thank you, Paul. Paul, I'm going to have to make a trip to California to get you this award. <laughs> and then share a glass of wine. Um, I would like to ask Kyle to come up to help us recognize a few more folks. The FAIR Ambassador Program began in 2013. Thank you. FAIR Ambassadors. Um, are a united team of patient volunteers living with FA who are committed to supporting FARA in the research for treatments and a cure. The program began with just a handful of volunteers. I, I remember us talking about starting the program. It was just like a brainstorm in the office one day. And has grown to over 80 volunteers today internationally. Four members of the leadership team recently completed their terms, and we'd like to take time to recognize their service. Can Erin O'Neill, Jean Walsh, and Alex Fielding make their way to the front? And Mary Bircher, I hope you're on the virtual stage. <laughs> Though their contributions are many, we'll just mention a few of them. Aaron and Jean are part of the founding uh, leadership team of the Ambassador Program and were instrumental in forming the program. Aaron has led the CARD team and facilitated timely and heartfelt acknowledgement of donors and researchers. Jean founded the Teen Hangout Program that provides a forum for teams to connect with others living with ataxia. And Mary has led the adult hangout team and managed Farah's Twitter for many years. And Alex has helped lead the speaking team and bring some structure to the program meetings. <laughs> yes, keeping Kyle in line. Um, <laughs> imagine having an agenda for a meeting. Um, so individually and collectively, they have strengthened relationships in our community, expanded FARA's bandwidth, and brought us all closer to treatments and a cure for FA. And we want to thank you all for your service and your friendship in building our community.
Um, I would just like you guys to stay up here so we can get a few photos. Um, and everyone else, you are good to go for lunch, but we do need to be back here at 1.15. So thank you all very much.